listen. Fighter pilots call it the sound of freedom. It's the echo of 40 years and more of challenge, sacrifice, and triumph. It's the sound of history, our history, and our nation's history. How did it begin, this thunder in the sun? The mid-50s, a time of exuberant change. From the depression of the 30s, the nation had plunged into the strictures and rationing of World War II. Now, for the first time in decades, Americans were enjoying a booming economy, and they ate it up. The jet age had arrived, and Americans were fascinated with the sleek new swept-wing fighters that had cleared the skies in Korea and broken the sound barrier in level flight. Our great national icon, the automobile, reflected their style. Well, most of them did. It was the era of poodle skirts, hula hoops, and hydrogen bombs. Behind the fads and conspicuous consumption, perhaps fueling them, lay a dark specter. Our World War II ally, the Soviet Union, was now an implacable enemy, and they had the bomb. The space race was on. The U.S. and Soviet Union were developing missiles to deliver nuclear warheads and to place payloads in orbit. The Soviets were ahead at the first lap. Sputnik, barely the size of a soccer ball, carried only a simple transmitter, but its monotonous beep sent a chilling message. Soviet test sites lay deep in a gigantic and seemingly impenetrable landmass. The U.S. was desperate for intelligence on these threats. A gawky, highly specialized U-2 could overfly the sites at 80,000 feet, but its slow speed and agonizingly long loiter time made it increasingly vulnerable to improving Soviet air defenses. It was only a matter of time. The U.S. government needed a better reconnaissance platform. By 1956, Lockheed was designing such an aircraft the CL-400. Pratt & Whitney was selected to develop a radical new engine, the liquid hydrogen-powered 304. This highly classified project was codenamed Suntan. At the same time, the U.S. Navy was formulating an advanced attack plane with a Mach 3 dash capability. It demanded an engine with far more thrust than any yet existing. Pratt & Whitney was approached to create a powerful new turbojet, the J-58. Dick Corr was chosen as chief engineer for both projects. Suntan was, was a project to develop a hydrogen-fueled fan for very high altitude operation, about Mach 2 at 100,000 feet. And the engine was a concept uh, invented by a fellow by the name of Ray, I think that was R-A-E. And he convinced the Air Force that this was the right kind of engine to use at very high altitude. But he had no facilities for developing an engine, and the Air Force turned to Pratt & Whitney to develop this engine, which we called a 304. And at the same time, we had another project. I was assigned another project, which was the J-58 for the Navy. And the Navy at that time was very interested in using what uh, fuels that were, that were were uh, doctored with uh, boron. Development of these new engines began in East Hartford, but it quickly became apparent that the Connecticut facility possessed neither the space, the noise containment, nor the security to see the programs through. The search for a new site led to a tract of land in the northeastern part of Florida's Everglades. The remote location near West Palm Beach was ideal except for swamps, mosquitoes, alligators, and rattlesnakes. In 1957, a contract was signed for construction of the new facility, and Pratt & Whitney's Florida Research and Development Center was born. Initial development was daunting. There was no direct access to the 7,000-acre site. The state of Florida agreed to build a road, the Beeline Highway, but the segment from West Palm Beach to the plant was delayed when the Loxahatchee Slough refused to cooperate. It swallowed tons of fill and two bulldozers. 
Designer Ray Schneider was one of the first employees hired specifically for the new facility. Well, the first uh, six weeks I was down here, the Beeline Highway wasn't open because of a, a quicksand problem and they couldn't uh, build a section of the road. So they routed us through the swamp on a dirt, uh, on a dirt road and uh, it was very interesting because it was hard to have two cars pass at the time. The road was so narrow. After more tons of fill and months of work, the beeline was finally completed. Plant construction was nearly as difficult. Unusually rainy weather turned construction sites into a sea of mud. Fill for building sites came from borrow pits, adding numerous new ponds and lakes. Environmental concerns led to creating new wetlands to replace those being filled for construction. Charles Rolke, the first general manager of the new facility, faced a number of obstacles. Pratt & Whitney was unwilling to part with experienced support personnel from Connecticut, and much of the workforce had to be recruited and trained locally. At the same time, the customers wanted work on the 304 and J58 to progress as quickly as possible. Construction was barely underway when J-58 and 304 engines began arriving from East Hartford. Work on these projects advanced rapidly in makeshift rented shops. The first permanent structures completed were the test stands. The Air Force built two facilities to generate liquid hydrogen for the 304. They were codenamed Mama Bear and Papa Bear, and for security reasons they were given a cover story local residents were told they were processing plants for the Apex Fertilizer Company. Despite the primitive conditions, spirits were high. A young engineer, Frank Maccabee, was part of that original cadre. A group of us, about 30 or 40 engineers and their families, had been transferred down from Hartford. Uh, all of us were young. Uh, the test engineer group, of course we had a, a management team as well, but our families were young. Uh, this was an area that had not been developed at all. Uh, the communities were practically bare of houses. As a matter of fact, uh, a whole new community was built in Lake Park, where I lived, and we were one of the first families to move in there. It was, everything was new, including the technology, the, the challenge, the uh, relationship with the customer, uh, the facility itself, it was all very exciting and we were all eager and, uh, and didn't know that we couldn't do some of the things that uh, actually were accomplished and we just had a lot of fun. There was a tremendous camaraderie. A year before the main office building was complete, both engines were ready for testing. In September 1957, the primitive quiet of the swamp was shattered by the roar of the first 304 test run a thunder heard for miles under sunny Florida skies. The J-58-2 progressed well for the Navy, and the engine made its initial test firing on Christmas Eve, 1957. On May 27, 1958, the Florida Research and Development Center was officially dedicated. The new Florida facilities direction may have seemed clearly defined. The nation's was not. Within the next five years, we saw the election and endured the assassination of a young new president, watched the communist takeover of Cuba, and sweated through the ensuing missile crisis. We held our breath as tiny Friendship 7 carried 41-year-old John Glenn into history as the first American in orbit. We watched the slow expansion of American involvement in a remote Asian country, and honored the call to place a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Pratt & Whitney faced its own unique challenges. In the early stages of the 304 program, skeptics feared that liquid hydrogen would never be safe. The mere mention of it conjured up visions of the Hindenburg disaster. But Pratt & Whitney devised efficient new ways to handle this volatile fuel, and the 304 proved safe and successful. Both programs were progressing on schedule, then came a strange musical chairs change. The Navy lost interest in developing their Mach 3 attack plane and work on the powerful J-58 ground to a halt after just a few test firings. At the same time, things were going badly for the Air Force's CL-400 program. As designed, the aircraft presented support problems. 
was based on technology already becoming obsolete and could not carry sufficient fuel for the needed range. The Air Force decided to start with a clean slate and canceled development of the CL-400. Work on the 304 hydrogen engine was suspended. The setback was brief. Pratt & Whitney's new expertise and new facility were just beginning to blossom. The U.S. still required a long-range reconnaissance platform. The Air Force and CIA recruited legendary aircraft designer Kelly Johnson and the super-secret Lockheed Skunk Works to design a new plane, the A-11. To meet the demands of high-altitude Mach 3 flight, they turned to Pratt & Whitney's new J-58 as the most promising engine candidate. At the same time, the need for space launch capabilities was growing rapidly. The Air Force enlisted Pratt & Whitney's newfound expertise with liquid hydrogen to develop a compact, powerful upper-stage booster engine, the LR-115. In 1961, the program was transferred to NASA, and the engine became known as the RL-10. The last contractual 304 tests were still underway when RL-10 development began. The company never missed a beat. I had the good fortune of being the test engineer responsible for assembling and testing the first RL-10, uh, which we called FX-121. Uh, it was a new technology. Hydrogen and oxygen had uh, never been used as a rocket fuel before in any quantity. The cycle that the engine uh, was based on was new, the, uh, the bootstrap cycle. The materials that we used uh, were uh, used for the first time in this environment. It was just all new and exciting. Uh, I remember the first time we fired the RL-10 uh, was on third shift. It was the middle of the night in the swamp. It was black as ink, the starry sky, and when that engine lit off, it was like uh, doomsday had arrived. A tremendous sheet of flame out the uh, diffuser, a noise that you've just never heard before, at least I had. Uh, it, was, it would actually get into your... Uh, lungs and breathe for you. It was just tremendously exciting. And the engine ran and ran and ran and ran. As a matter of fact, I believe it was 426 seconds, which doesn't sound like long, but at that time it was the longest duration firing of any rocket engine anywhere. We had set a new record that night. While things went well for the new RL-10, adapting the J-58 for the A-11 was not as simple as anticipated. The technical demands of sustained Mach 3 flight were daunting. They required not just new designs, but completely new concepts. A brilliant engineer, Bob Abernathy, devised ducts that allowed inlet air to bypass the compressor in supersonic flight. This simplified the inlet design, and at high Mach numbers, virtually converted the engine from a turbojet to a ramjet. The engine structure had to stand these very high stresses, pressures, at uh, 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, metal temperature. That melts most things. Uh, the lab found a way to make, make it possible to weld what we used to use for turbine blades called wasp alloy in, in sheet structure. If the J-58 had to operate at temperatures beyond the tolerance of available metals, there was a simple solution do the impossible, and create new ways to process previously unusable alloys that could do the job. Joe Moore was a young materials engineer when he was faced with these challenges. Considering the complexity of the task, his first exposure to the materials laboratory was disconcerting. Shortly after I came to work, I looked at the situation and I thought, my God, we're not a development lab, and that was why I'd been brought there, however, the guy that brought me said he wanted to make it more of a real development laboratory. And I looked at it and I thought, my gosh, this place is just a control lab. They check pieces that come in and stock, raw stock that comes in to see if they meet the mechanical and chemical requirements and that's about it. And so I, I truly did this, it sounds corny, but I, I made up my mind that I wanted to see us become the best laboratory in the world, period. 
Design of the A11 at Lockheed faced similar challenges. At Mach 3, portions of the aircraft skin would reach temperatures of nearly 1,000 degrees, well above the melting point of conventional materials. Kelly Johnson's engineers turned to Pratt & Whitney's pioneering work with titanium alloys for the answer. The next few years of RL-10 and J-58 development were fraught with difficulties as FRDC delved into the unknown. Dick Mulready was a driving force behind the new science of cryogenic fuels. Hydrogen is an excellent working fluid, which means that it doesn't take much of it as a flow material through a turbine to generate a lot of power. And because it was hydrogen, we could take the hydrogen that was going to be burned in the engine, use it to cool the thrust chamber, and the heat that it extracted from the thrust chamber was enough to drive the turbo pumps. So the hydrogen flows into the, through the pump, around through the cooling jacket, and then up into the chamber. So all of it is used, nothing is wasted, there's no gas generator that throws away anything. And so it's an, a, it's an elegant cycle. It really is perfection. And it's the reason the engine has now lasted uh, over 40 years. It's the longest living mark at Pratt & Whitney for an engine. Well, we took the engine, which had been run horizontally, put it in a pair up in the E5 stand, and uh, made a firing one day. Al Gardner was with me. He was the Air Force project officer. And uh, everything worked fine. The next day, there was a second firing on E5 stand, and there was an explosion. That second firing was eagerly attended by a group of NASA officials, led by the renowned German rocket scientist Werner von Braun. William Missimer was a young instrumentation engineer who witnessed the event. We pushed the button for the run and all these dignitaries were there and the stand blew up. I mean, not a little blow up. This was a big blow up that lit up the sky and it was a thousand foot plume went up. And we all turned pale and uh, I, can, I could heard, hear Von Braun saying, ach, shit. <laughs> and he turned around and walked out. Uh, well, that led to uh, a very long but wonderful episode that had a happy ending where that place turned to and found out why that problem happened. It was an ignition problem. And believe it or not, all previous tests, we had the RL-10 was laying horizontal and it ignited very, very reliably. When you put it in a vertical position, you got the wrong mixture ratio uh, for ignition, one lit and the other one just put put down into a common exhaust, unburned propellants, and it went off like a bomb. But getting to that answer uh, was one of the most exciting technical witch hunts I've ever been through. The RL-10's ignition problems were ultimately solved, and the engine passed its preliminary flight rating test in January 1962. The J-58 passed its preliminary flight rating test just a few months later. Under a cloak of secrecy, flight testing of the A-11 progressed rapidly, and an experimental interceptor version, the YF-12A, entered operational service. A reconnaissance version became operational in January 1966, the legendary SR-71 Blackbird. Though now retired from the U.S. Air Force, the SR-71 still holds numerous speed and altitude records thanks to the J-58. 2,193 miles per hour in level flight and sustained level flight at 85,069 feet. In 1990, it flew from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. in one hour, four minutes and 19.89 seconds. NASA still operates the SR-71 for high altitude research. The RL-10 was also about to make history, but not without some tense moments first. The first launch, of course, was disastrous because uh, the Atlas launch vehicle suffered a failure on liftoff and exploded essentially on the pad. There's a funny story about that. 
Uh, one of our people was in the telemetry shack at the Cape, and his job was to monitor the telemetry from the engine during the launch and report back to Bill Gorton, who was the uh, vice president and general manager down here then, uh, of what kind of performance we were seeing from the engine once it fired in space. So the Atlas fired and lifted off about, oh, about three feet off the pad and the sustainer engine shut down and the vehicle slowly settled back down into the launch pad into a tremendous explosion. You can imagine how much, uh, how big a fireball that much hydrogen and oxygen makes. Well, the telemetry package on the Centaur vehicle, the upper stage, which our engines were on, uh, was battery powered and it was external to the vehicle. And when the explosion occurred, it was blown free of the vehicle into a field about 300 yards away. And it lay there radiating. It was still sending out signals. Our fellow in the telemetry shack was watching those signals on a trace on an oscilloscope. And it didn't show anything other than that everything was normal. The engine, of course, hadn't fired at that time and wasn't supposed to. So all the traces were flat and looked normal. So he was reporting back to Bill Gorton and the rest of the management group down here that everything was fine. In the meantime, the vehicle was a smoking pile of rubbish on the launch pad. Finally, in November 1963, two RL-10s successfully boosted a Centaur upper stage into orbit. Uh, again, the group of us had gone there somewhat apprehensive because we had had so many problems in the past. And this launch was picture perfect. Everything went according to schedule. And when the telemetry traces showed that the RL-10s had fired right on schedule, the chamber pressure came up and held constant right where it was supposed to. It was the greatest feeling you can imagine. Two months later, the six RL-10s of a Saturn S4 stage propelled a 37,000 pound payload into orbit, successfully demonstrating the practicality of hydrogen oxygen fuel for the Apollo moon exploration program. The RL-10 went on to set the standard for performance and reliability in upper stage propulsion systems. It boosted seven surveyor missions to the lunar surface in preparation for Apollo. It powered Mariner and Pioneer to our neighboring planets and sent Voyager to the farthest reaches of our solar system and beyond. The success of the RL-10 and J-58 quickly led to other pioneering programs. FRDC began development of a high-pressure rocket engine quite different from the RL-10. Instead of an expander cycle, the engine used a pre-burner to drive turbo pumps delivering the cryogenic fuels. It had tremendous growth potential. From a 50,000-pound thrust demonstrator, the concept grew to 250,000 pounds in just a few years. In June of 1964, the FAA awarded both Pratt & Whitney and General Electric contracts to develop an engine for a proposed supersonic transport. With the experience of the J-58, Pratt & Whitney's designers appeared to have a substantial edge in development of this 54,000-pound thrust high Mach power plant, and they tackled the project with enthusiasm. Employment rose to 7,000. The engine was completed ahead of schedule, and ran on March 31, 1966. By December, the test phase was complete, and the engine had run at speeds up to Mach 2.7 at 65,000 feet. The Christmas holidays began on a jubilant note. On New Year's Eve, that euphoria was shattered with the announcement that GE had won the SST engine contract. The unfortunate thing is that even though the SST program uh, didn't proceed, GE got millions of dollars in, in development for high temperature jets that, that we didn't get. Other development programs, such as the Sea Jet Marine Engine, were lacking in a viable market. In an effort to keep the facility alive, responsibility for all J-58 overhaul was transferred from East Hartford to FRDC, along with production and assembly of several other military engine components. In September 1967, FRDC received a contract for development of the ST-9, a new turboshaft engine for the proposed U.S. Army Utah's helicopter. 
The company also started contract work on a 250,000 pound thrust rocket engine and began research on the use of gas dynamic lasers as weapon systems. But none of these programs offered the immediate business benefits the company required. The future of FRDC was still in jeopardy. 1967 was a rough year for the Air Force too. The Soviets introduced the MiG-25, a formidable new fighter which shattered numerous performance records and threatened NATO air dominance. In the skies over North Vietnam, it was increasingly evident that the dogfighting capability of current U.S. fighters was marginal at best. The Air Force quickly initiated a competition for a new air superiority fighter, the FX competition. The Navy, too, was seeking a new engine for its proposed F-14. Once again, Pratt & Whitney was pitted against GE. This was a must-win situation, and FRDC responded admirably. Their entry? The remarkable F-100. 1968, FRDC's 10th anniversary. Ten long years, one short decade. America was now deeply enmeshed in Vietnam, but results seemed frustratingly elusive. World War II had ended with a dearly bought but unequivocal victory. Korea concluded with an unsatisfactory and unsettling stalemate. With Vietnam, the public became increasingly skeptical of official reassurances. Government news releases reported a light at the end of the tunnel but the massive communist Tet Offensive of 1968 finally shattered public complacency and polarized the nation. Ahead, the nation faced a painful extrication from Southeast Asia, the resignation of a disgraced president and disco. There were moments of glory, though. In 1969, we watched our TVs in awe and anticipation as Neil Armstrong took that first small step and forever changed mankind's place in the universe. Our old icon, the automobile, no longer sported fins, but cars were still aerodynamic and powerful. Most of them, anyway. If the events of the late 60s and early 70s left the public disillusioned with the military-industrial complex, Pratt & Whitney knew the future was not that simple. Regardless of public opinion, the nation still faced very real threats and possibilities. The F-100 competition was challenging. The Air Force demanded an engine with a higher thrust-to-weight ratio than any previously designed. Winning the contract was critical to FRDC's survival. Well, the biggest problem in the F-100 is to get the weight down. Uh, the original design we had uh, didn't make it. Uh, we had some pretty good information that told us we were off the mark on the weight. And Bill Brown, I'll call credit for uh, uh, getting a design change that got the weight down. But, but doing this, is getting the weight down is what made it risky. Uh, the other parameters were, were well within hand, but trying to do this job with the weight that we went after was a real tough program. And to do this, we did need to have iron 100 in the turbine discs. Another materials laboratory breakthrough, gatorizing, provided one key to solving the weight problem. We did a very, a very unusual thing, and I, frankly, I don't remember why we did it, but we did. We took the material and we did not heat treat it, and we tested it. And uh, we tested uh, tensile properties up in the uh, 1700 to 2200 degree range, and uh, ran stress rupture and tensile. And we were absolutely amazed when the rupture results came in because as soon as the guy loaded the specimen, it just stretched like chewing gum. And we became very excited over this because these alloys like I am 100 are very difficult to move, to forge without cracking and so on. And here was this stuff just, you know, stretching like putty. So it occurred to us, gee, if you can get the material in that kind of condition, if you can pull it like that in tensile, why can't you put it in a compressor, which is a forge motion, and do the same thing and come out with forgings uh, that are very, very close in that shape with a reduction of machining 
and uh, something that had no cracks in it. Like I said, I have a super strong alloy, like iron 100. So we set up a little forging rig, uh, put the material in a super plastic condition, heated up the whole system, and held it at temperature. And we were able to make little small pancakes with just beautiful surfaces and tight configurations. So that said to us, boy, we got something here. And we went after a big forge cycle, and then of course we sold it to the Air Force for F-100 disc. And uh, in fact, we sold it to them, and we won the contract before we ever made a full-scale disc. We based everything on on uh, s small scale pieces, which is kind of dangerous. Dangerous it may have been. But the full-scale IN-100 discs proved every bit as good as the tests promised. The result was a lightweight engine with an 8 to 1 thrust to weight ratio, producing nearly 25,000 pounds of thrust. It was a 25% improvement over any previous engine. The first F-100 engine ran June 30, 1969 and began a grueling test series. Problems encountered were quickly fixed and the schedule was maintained. In March of 1970, the Air Force announced Pratt & Whitney's selection to power the new F-15 Eagle. Simultaneously, the U.S. Navy selected a version of the same engine, the F-401, for the new F-14 Tomcat. Full-scale development began immediately. It was a rigorous schedule, running in parallel with airframe development. In November 1974, the first production F-15s were delivered on time to the U.S. Air Force. The Navy version of the engine, however, experienced delays. The Navy canceled its order for the F-401 and opted for East Hartford's existing TF-30. In May 1970, NASA requested design proposals from Pratt & Whitney, Rocketdyne, and Aerojet for a high-pressure, reusable, hydrogen-oxygen-powered main engine for the future space shuttle. Dick Mulready, along with some folks from the research lab, had started a program of high-pressure, high-chamber-pressure rocketry and had demonstrated very successfully uh, that a uh, very high-pressure engine could be built and cooled and would be very efficient. So when the space shuttle main engine program came along and the re request for quotations went out for the engine, we responded with a proposal based on that technology. We had put about, the company had put about 10 years of effort into it and a lot of company money. It uh, was R&D of course, but it was still all paid for by the company and we had actually demonstrated the concept at full pressure. So we submitted our proposal to NASA and uh, in this new environment that we were learning to live in, uh, where the contractor is just a person that, that uh, NASA uses when it's convenient for them, uh, they gave our design, which our proposal, of course, which we had uh, written under their aegis and they had paid for, uh, they gave that information to our competition. And they said, we like this design concept, this high-pressure engine concept, better than the concepts which you have put forward. So we want you, the competitors to Pratt & Whitney, to take their concept and make a proposal based on that. Well, that was, <laughs> that was an insult beyond insult, as far as we were concerned. But it happened, and we had to live with it. Despite this turn of events, Pratt & Whitney was confident that their experience and established technical expertise would prevail. It came as a tremendous shock when the contract was awarded to Rocketdyne in July 1971. A satisfactory explanation for the choice was never offered. Pratt & Whitney appealed the decision to the U.S. Comptroller General. After a six-month legal battle, Pratt & Whitney lost the appeal. The decision effectively took FRDC out of the space business for years to come, except for continuing development of the workhorse RL-10. That loss, however, may have had some positive aspects. My view is it's a doggone good thing we didn't get that competition because we were right in the middle of the F-100 program at that time, and there was absolutely no way in the world that we could have handled the two of them. 
they both would have failed and we would have gone down the tubes. In December of the same year, the U.S. Army selected GE's entry over Pratt & Whitney's ST-9 to power its new utility helicopter. On the plus side, however, in addition to the huge new F-100 contract, FRDC's laser research was generating interest. And in December 1972, the Air Force funded a program to place a gas dynamic laser aboard a flying test bed, the Airborne Laser Laboratory. One key architect of Pratt & Whitney's laser program was William Missimer. Actually, after we lost the uh, engine contract for the space shuttle main engine to Rocketdyne, uh, it was a big blow to the company, and, uh, but we had developed facilities and capabilities in E-Area that fit the type of laser that was in vogue at that time very well. Uh, it was a gas dynamic laser, which believe it or not, uh, from a propulsion standpoint is almost like a rocket engine. It uh, had some cryogenic fluids and had very tight tolerances and um, the only thing that was new to us and foreign was the optics part. One of my first jobs was setting up the optics for some of these tests and um, I remember we had the Army in one day and they set up their, their experiment downrange, I think it was a tank or a piece of a tank or something. And uh, we had set up the telescope and there was, a lot, there was a wind blowing quite a bit. We all went up to the control room and closed up, buttoned up the facility the same way you would for a rocket test. It's all remote controlled. And the Army guys were sitting there and we pressed the button and the laser came on and the beam didn't appear for a while downrange. It did, and then all of a sudden it was there and it, and it did its thing. We couldn't figure out what the delay was. So I went down and here the wind had blown the door shut on the steel door shut on the telescope room and that Hummer burned a hole through the door and then went down range and did its job. Well after we did the initial research work on what was then called the XLD-1, that was a one megawatt boilerplate uh, laser that we put into E8 stand and proved the uh, capability of the, of the high energy lasers. The Air Force got very interested in a lightweight version of that that would go into a modified 707 airplane. But then the challenge became how do you lightweight this thing so it's flyable and also make it safe. Now here's where the jet engine smarts came in because they looked at Pratt as being able to man rate something from a safety standpoint which was extremely important. They could not, or we could not, afford any kind of an accident in flight with this uh, demonstrator, even though it was a highly classified program. So we won the contract, and in those days it was a pretty sizable contract, to uh, make this a flyable, lightweight system. In 1973, General Dynamics chose the F-100 engine for the YF-16, its entry in the Air Combat Fighter Competition. The YF-16 won the competition in early 1975 and Pratt & Whitney's F-100 was a key part of its success. That same year, the F-100 further proved its quality when the F-15 Streak Eagle set eight time-to-climb records. In its final flight, the Streak Eagle accelerated from a dead standstill on the runway to 98,424 feet, almost 19 miles straight up in less than three and a half minutes. This smashed the MiG-25's old record by nearly 30 seconds. Four NATO countries, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Belgium, had recently formed a consortium to seek a new fighter. The performance and cost of the new F-16 and its F-100 engine caught their eye. As an incentive, Pratt & Whitney and General Dynamics offered an unprecedented international co-production agreement, and the F-16 was quickly flying with and being co-produced by our allies. Now, with East Hartford's TF-30 and FRDC's F-100, Pratt & Whitney held the enviable position of powering the three best fighters in the free world. The F-14 Tomcat, the F-15 Eagle, and the F-16 Fighting Falcon. To meet the demands of the F-100 program, FRDC had grown further, and in 1976, as part of a major reorganization, it was renamed Pratt & Whitney Government Products Division. 
The new division was given management responsibility for all military engine programs, including the J-52, J-57, J-75, TF-30, and others. By 1978, our 20th anniversary, things had changed dramatically for the company and the nation. The fuel crisis of the 70s affected our economy and our psyche. Our cars reflected that change. The great land yachts and gas-guzzling muscle cars of the 60s were giving way to smaller, more fuel-efficient cars, many more of them with foreign names. Four years earlier, after more than a decade of fighting, the Vietnam War had reached a dismal end. Public sentiment was now strongly against military spending and military involvement. Interest rates were rising, and the country was slipping into recession. It profoundly affected the way consumers made their purchases, and Pratt & Whitney's biggest consumer, the U.S. government, was no exception. Pratt & Whitney had been riding high on the new F-100 contracts, had slowly lost touch with the customer's needs, and was in for a shock. Frank McAbee had just become president of GPD. Traditionally, when you want a military engine contract, uh, you had that business and your business base that you could forecast and you knew you were going to have the production volume in future years to support you. That uh, particular tradition was about to change though and was changing uh, very rapidly in the early 80s. Uh, when I became president of GPD, uh, it had uh, almost reached the boiling point. Those of us who worked in Washington were well aware of the fact that the F-100, which had just been introduced into service, while it was performing beautifully, was having some problems. Uh, we knew that the military was not particularly happy to have those problems, which the opponents to the military program in the Congress could use as an example of how the military really didn't know how to run a program and that everything they did turned out bad. So the pressure was on both sides. Uh, we knew that the military was seriously considering giving some of our business to GE. We knew that GE had uh, developed their F-110 engine in competition with the F-100 earlier on and that they had continued to develop it uh, to some degree with, company, with their own company money to uh, have in case our engine didn't work out and they, had a, they pursued a very active and vigorous lobbying campaign with both the Congress and the military to displace us, to show that our problems were bigger than we were able to handle. Uh, any issues that arose where there was any type of question as to Pratt & Whitney's responsiveness uh, to the government problems or to the military's problems, the competition obviously took advantage of that and played that up. So it was, it was a very tense time. And uh, the engine was working fine. It was actually working too well because it had such a high thrust to weight ratio, so much better than any previous engine, that the pilots in the operating units were flying the airplane well outside the envelope. They never wanted to pull the throttle back. They wanted to use the afterburner a lot. You, you know how pilots are. They're, they're like the rest of us. They like sports cars, and they want to zoom around the sky. But as a result of that, the engine was being pushed beyond some of its design limits, and it was having some premature failures. So we had that to contend with. The Air Force, in the meantime, had uh, decided that the way to get our attention, perhaps, was to uh, threaten to give part of the business to GE. Our management did not respond well to that. Uh, we just didn't understand, uh, and I'm sure that it wasn't unusual that anyone would have understood that particular circumstance, that you know we had won the competition, it was our engine, we would fix the problem, so why not just leave us where we were? Leave us alone, let us do the job. Just give us money and go away, which is not all that different than the Pratt attitude over the years. In any event, the Air Force decided they were going to run a competition, and thus began the Great Engine War, as it's known. It was Pratt against GE. 
And the proposal that we submitted uh, was based on, to a great degree, us getting all the business. And that really wasn't what the customer wanted. And as a result, GE was given 65% of the contract uh, the first year. That was a great disappointment. It was a tremendous shock to us, to everybody in, in the plant. Everybody. Uh, a lot of gloom and doom. The Great Engine War, as it came to be known, had a profound influence on every aspect of GPD's existence. Winning back the customer's confidence was not an easy task. It required a drastic change in corporate culture. Quality, customer support, and cost were critically examined and constantly emphasized at every level of business. The company even tried to change their image with a modernized version of the logo. Employees were less than happy. To counter the antipathy that had evolved, Pratt & Whitney began sending engineers and designers to air bases to see their products in real life operation. Air Force and Navy aircraft were brought to the Florida facility so employees could see the end results of their labors and meet the men who flew them. I remember the first time we had an F-14 come into GPD. Uh, the pilot of that airplane was named uh, Hank Kleeman, Commander Hank Kleeman. He had been the pilot who shot down a Syrian jet uh, about six months or a year prior to the time that he visited the plant here. He was a hero. Uh, he uh, came here with his uh, radar officer, the, the other member of the uh, crew, they landed at Gwynn, and we towed the airplane up in front of the plant, and then uh, the two pilots went around and talked to people. And I'll never forget, there was a lady who worked in um, plant engineering. Uh, not a very high position, but nonetheless uh, a good employee. And she broke into tears while she was talking to Hank Lehman. She was so proud of the part that she had played, that Pratt & Whitney had played, and that victory that Cleman was part of, that she actually broke down and cried. And to me, that was a, a tremendous insight into the value of having people feel part of what you're doing. Eventually, the company proved their new demeanor was real, and the traditional logo was restored. This process of soul searching, of analysis of attitudes, reached beyond the customer. At this point, Bill Missimer was executive vice president. Uh, when Harry Gray came to UTC, before that was actually United Aircraft, uh, he brought with him the, the many, many new ideas, one of which was to, to make profit centers, and that's when we became government products division. And another one was he had a code. He said that we have a responsibility to customers, shareholders, employees and the community. Bill Dwyer was an exceptionally fine individual who fit uh, his, his role as uh, Vice President for Community Relations extremely well. Uh, he was a very humorous guy. He always had an appropriate joke. He was an outstanding speaker and you could tell that he loved people. Uh, he got us involved with obviously United Way. He was involved with the Urban League. Uh, Special Olympics, um, some of his legacies today, the science fair, for example, that the engineers do such a good job of encouraging, uh, are all legacies of Bill Dwyer. He was very well thought of in the community, and as you know, uh, there's now a senior high school named in his honor, not too far from here. Through the late 70s and the 80s, improvements continued on the F-100, and it grew into a family of engines. The PW-200 model featured performance and durability improvements. In part, these improvements came from new materials laboratory innovations, like RSR and GatorGuard, an improved plasma spray coating system that found many uses. RSR was an innovative method for processing inert powdered metal alloys. Joe Moore explains. RSR stands for rapid solidification rate. And uh, you make 
powder under inert conditions. We invented a machine our boys did, came up with a, a fantastic machine for making powder and rapidly solidifying it. What, what happened was it consisted of a spinning disc and the metal would be poured in a vacuum chamber into the, from the crucible into a, a nozzle onto a spinning disc. And the rotation of the disc with centrifugal force throws the metal out in, in 360 degrees all around. And then we had a blast of argon, a circular curtain around the, the spinning disc in order to, to uh, increase the speed of, of solidification. And what we were doing was, if we, as we had always done since the J-58 development, was we were reaching for a stronger turbine bleed material using the RSR. East Hartford's materials laboratory created another breakthrough technique, single crystal turbine blades. This innovation was quickly adapted for use in military engines and dramatically increased the hot section life of the F-100. The development of single crystal blades, coupled with a new digital electronic engine control, the DEEK, ushered in the F-100 PW220. The PW220 set a new standard for durability, reliability and safety and was chosen by the U.S. Air Force Aerial Demonstration Team, the Thunderbirds. Work also continued on a higher thrust version of the F-100. With almost 5,000 pounds more thrust, the PW-229 entered operational service in the F-15E and the F-16C by the end of the decade. A 20,000 pound thrust straight turbojet version of the F-100, the PW-1120 was not so lucky. It was selected to power Israel's Lavi fighter, but that program died in the Israeli Knesset. Two other programs of the 80s did not fare well either. GPD developed the PW-3005 for the V-22 Osprey and the T-800 for the Army's LHX helicopter. Both these turboshaft engines lost their competitions. During this decade, the Navy began re-engining F-14s with GE's F-110 and production finally ended for the venerable J-52 used in the A-6 Intruder and EA-6B Prowler. For the first time since Pratt & Whitney's founding, the company was no longer building engines for the U.S. Navy. NASA was now seeking improved turbo pumps for the space shuttle main engine. The current Rocketdyne pumps had to be rebuilt after each flight. John Balliger was the division executive vice president at the time. There became an opportunity, which was called the alternate turbo pump program for the Rocketdyne engine, which powers the space shuttle. And we went after that tooth and nail. That was the program that we felt we had to win uh, in order to start our space program growth that we so desperately needed. And we worked very hard on that. We brought in a lot of people who were very knowledgeable in the industry, people who had retired, people who were out of NASA and retired, uh, to put together one of the best proposals uh, I think I've seen. And we won. Pratt & Whitney resumed work on their SSME pumps and was now able to offer NASA turbo pumps that could fly 55 missions between overhauls. But much development work still lay ahead. The RL-10 was continually evolving too, with increased thrust, a wider range of applications, and an unparalleled success record. Over 500 successful firings in space. We have two Centaur engines up and running. Space provided another outlet for the company's technical excellence and creativity. NASA tapped Pratt & Whitney to develop an engine for the proposed National Aerospace Plane. The NASP stretched the boundaries of conventional engine design. The aircraft was designed to take off and land like a conventional airliner at existing airports but would fly to the very edge of space at speeds of Mach 25. It called for an engine of unprecedented versatility, one that would start as a conventional turbojet, convert to a ramjet, and ultimately to a true rocket engine. Pratt & Whitney had one of the country's few Cray supercomputers, and design work that would have taken years was condensed into months. New materials and concepts were explored. Subscale testing was already underway when congressional budget cuts put the program on hold. 
The nature of air warfare was evolving in the early 80s, and agility was becoming an increasingly important issue. Research began on vectoring nozzles for jet engines. Roger Bercy was in charge of this program. Well, there was a lot of uh, discussions back in the 60s by a German aerodynamist, uh, Dr. Wolfgang Herbst. He felt that the new aircraft of the future had to have a lot of agility. And in the upper left-hand corner where there's a minimum of aerodynamic power, he felt that some maneuvers would enhance the agility of aircraft in that what was known as the post-stall region of the flight envelope. And he felt that one of the means of achieving this agility was to have the use of the thrust of the engines to augment the aerodynamic services. Uh, in order to accomplish that, uh, it could have been done with a series of external paddles that could uh, deflect the thrust. However, that was cumbersome, added weight, added drag, and hence the aerodynamicists of that era determined that if we could come up with a system to vector the thrust of the engine and have it transparent to the pilot, we could accomplish those feats. With that in mind, our advanced technology team here started a series of testing with scale models and then eventually led to a very successful flight test. Uh, and I can recall the first flight, it was absolutely rewarding on May 10th, 1989, out at Edwards Air Force Base to see the two-dimensional nozzle uh, fly. The, the folks uh, indicated that if now we had the success of taking thrust vectoring into the pitch mode, and they says, if we can do this, why can't we do this? And that's called the yaw mode. Coupled with the pitch and yaw, we says, if you can do both, why can't you have a multi-axis thrust vectoring? So we uh, launched a uh, review in uh, 1992 with a ground demonstrator uh, made up of uh, various components and successfully demonstrated a multi-axis thrust vectoring. The Air Force's changing mission meant quicker response time on a global scale. And the current generation of airlifters was not versatile enough to meet the new demands. Design work began on the C-17, an aircraft capable of moving huge loads anywhere in the world and landing on short, unimproved strips practically at the front lines. Pratt & Whitney developed a militarized version of the proven PW-2037, the F-117. It provided the power, durability, and reversing capability needed by the Globemaster III. By the end of the 80s, the F-100 and the F-15 would have seen 15 years of service. By the new millennium, they would be over a quarter century old, ancient by fighter aircraft standards. Quietly in the background, work was underway on a superb new fighter engine, the next generation beyond the F-100. Guiding this effort was Frank Gillette. We built this engine on the information that we got out of the ATAG program, which is Advanced Technology Engine Gas Generator. At our plant, we call it 689. The compressor, the combustor, and turbine were designed before 83 that we just picked up and just refined so that we had a real good common core, which gave us a basis to do everything. Our design objectives at that time was a balanced design. And in the balanced design, what we wanted was performance. We wanted cost, we wanted durability, and of, of, of the most important we wanted to do this time that hadn't been done is increase our supportability. Now the performance, we wanted the, the highest specific uh, thrust engine that has ever been made. We ran our first demo engine in 19, October of 1986, and it was a thrill uh, to see this very powerful engine run uh, down in the test stand with a 2D CD nozzle. It was very exciting for us and we were very proud of all the work and accomplishments of our people. The PW5000 was well underway when the government announced a competition for an advanced tactical fighter to replace the aging F-15 in the next century. Two aircraft company teams led by Northrop and Lockheed would compete along with two engine manufacturers. Each engine would fly in both aircraft. It was Pratt & Whitney versus General Electric again. 
the PW5000 officially became the YF119, and design and testing shifted into high gear. The airplane wanted supersonic persistence, and that means an airplane can go faster than Mach 1 without using the afterburner, and that was the exciting thing. That's the big change in technology that the ATF would have over any other airplane. In other words, the ATF, or now the F-22, can fly the same place that an F-15 can go without using the afterburner. The other big change to this airplane was is low observable, which means a stealthy airplane. And we've accomplished that over a lot of technology and a lot of art. This will be an awesome airplane. This airplane will be as good as an F-117 stealth fighter, but it'll go supersonic and it'll turn and burn and it'll put an air dominance into this United States that we will always have superiority. We won't need to talk about superiority, we'll talk about air dominance. 1988, our 30th year in Florida. The facility was now called Pratt & Whitney Government Engine Business. With the advent of detente, the old Soviet peril that had driven so many of our enterprises was rapidly diminishing and would soon vanish. The aerospace industry had a saying, and it was that we've lost our enemy. And that was goodness in the big picture. But in uh, the smaller local picture affecting Pratt & Whitney, it required that we do some major restructuring of the company. And we did. Unfortunately, we were not unique. Um, we ended up in our restructuring program, which at that time was not called a restructuring program, but today it's a household word. Uh, we lost about a third of our business, and uh, we lost about a third of our resources, uh, of which most of that was people. Uh, I think we handled those restructuring actions in, in probably the best humane way we could. And we spent a lot of time making sure that the hurt to people was minimized, and uh, it still hurt but at least we knew we had done the best job we could to minimize that and to try to keep families whole and uh, move on. So it was a tough time for Pratt & Whitney, uh, especially tough for the military side of the business. And uh, the Air Force picture, the U.S. Air Force picture was not pretty, which was our number one customer. So we really focused on international sales, which were really probably the savior in a large part of the F-100 program. We did very well in the international campaigns. Uh, not that we won them without some difficulty and some financial contribution, but we did do very, very well as a team, and we're able to bring in additional volume uh, to put in on top of the U.S. Air Force domestic volume. At that same time, we wanted to be sure that we didn't lose sight of the ultimate goal which we've been working on for many years, under the leadership of people like Frank Gillette and Gary Plourd, who were working the next engine, the next advanced engine, for what that program was called at that time was the Advanced Tactical Fighter. Contrary to public euphoria, the end of the Cold War revealed a world more unstable and full of unconfined threats. A nation was reawakening to its resolve as a world leader the cars, though? What can you say about an 88 anything? Pratt & Whitney's Florida facility had responded to the challenges of the previous decade. The spirit of teamwork that exemplified the early days of FRDC was reborn. New prizes were there for the company to win, if they proved worthy. In 1990, as Pratt & Whitney accelerated their pursuit of space business, United Technologies formed Space Propulsion and Systems, uniting its Chemical Systems Division and United Space Boosters Industries with Pratt & Whitney's space business. Doug North became its president. As the decade closed, ATF flight competition was underway, and problems that emerged were corrected, often with the help of the advanced computing power now available, but also by the instincts of good people. Well, my closest moment, I'll have to say, during the 15 years of being engineering manager of the 119, was an engine called YF-4. It was the first engine that went into the, supposed to go into the F, uh, YF-22. 
We had run the engine down here to pass our qualifications to ship it to Edwards. And the engine passed the qualification. Two people came to me, Lou Wilson and Tony Aiken, and said, Frank, I know we passed the qualification, but the engine isn't right. Said, what do you mean? They showed me the tracking plots. The vibration wasn't what we had seen for seven years. This was on a Thursday, and the C-141 was supposed to come in on Tuesday of the next week. So we had a lot of work to do to get ready, packed, to go out. And obviously, GE was already flying in the YF-22, and we had a fly to be a winner. These guys came up and still kept telling me the engine wasn't right. On Friday, we decided to take the engine apart, and I know a lot of people didn't agree with that, but these two guys uh, really instilled in me we should do it. We took the engine apart, and we found out that on the number two bearing support, we had left all the bolts out, and the only thing that was holding this engine was the snaps. We saw that on Saturday morning. Thank goodness with the, the persistence of these people, we put those bolts in, passed the test, packed that engine up on, on Saturday night, had it ready Monday. The plane came in on, on Tuesday. We flew it out to Edwards, and that engine was the first one to go fly with, with engine number five in YF-22. So the lesson I learned is listen to your people. Without that, this engine on the first roll-up probably would have come out the inlet. We could have lost the contract. We could have uh, uh, not been here in Florida enjoying this great reputation we have. So what I learned out of that is listen to the workers. When they've got a gut feeling and data that says to change it, please listen and change it. But probably the most exciting times in my life is to go out and see the YF-23 fly for the first time. Very emotional, brings tears to your eyes. I have trouble talking about it right now. And then we flew the YF-22, uh, and that was really thrilling. Finally, on April 6, 1991, came the announcement we had waited for. Lockheed's F-22 would be the new air dominance fighter for the 21st century, and Pratt & Whitney's F-119 would give it the needed muscle. We won the honor to power the NCAA. PYBBN vectoring nozzles were undergoing flight evaluation on the F-15 Active and would soon be installed on the F-16 Vista, setting the stage for a new generation of thrust vectoring engines and aircraft. The SSME turbo pumps also progressed through critical testing here and at NASA facilities. Finally, on July 13, 1996, a single Pratt & Whitney alternate SSME oxidizer turbo pump flew two, aboard the space shuttle. One. And liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery to complete NASA's constellation of tracking stations in the sky. By year's end, another shuttle flight carried Pratt & Whitney pumps on all three main engines. Work was also well underway to certify the fuel turbo pumps. The space business was growing. There was potential to help make up for decreased military spending but it required a radical business approach. We felt that we were lacking in having no resources dedicated to large liquid boosters, which were, from everything we could see, the booster of the future. There was no money to develop one in the United States. NASA didn't have the money. We certainly couldn't fund a program to develop a new booster engine. It was just too expensive. We examined the Russian uh, stable of technology and engines they had and we found that there was an excellent engine uh, put out by Energomash, a company just outside of Moscow. Uh, and that engine led to developing a two-barrel version of that four-barrel RD-170, which was called the RD-180. Pratt & Whitney entered into a joint venture with Russia's NPO Energomash to adapt and market Russian RD-120 and RD-180 rocket engines. It was a high-risk gamble, 
considering the unsettled nature of Russia's new politics. But NPO Energomash is the acknowledged world leader in heavy lift liquid fuel rocket engines. The RD-120 arrived at the Florida facility, was mounted in the E-8 test stand, and on October 11th, 1995, became the first Russian rocket engine ever fired in the U.S. Start. One, two, three. The much larger RD-180 produces nearly one million pounds of thrust and has already been selected for the Atlas 2AR and 3A launch vehicles. The RD-180 has also been selected to power the new EELV, the evolved expendable launch vehicle. Now, with nearly 600 successful firings, the RL-10 will be used on the upper stage of all three major U.S. launch vehicles, the Atlas, Titan, and Delta. Since its inception, Pratt & Whitney's space propulsion efforts existed to serve government customers and operated in conjunction with the jet engine side of the business. Now, with a renewed commitment to space propulsion, a broader base of products, and a rapidly growing commercial market, the company created a new business unit, Pratt & Whitney Liquid Space Propulsion. Angie Negron is the vice president and general manager of LSP. We have been very active in hypersonics. We have two active programs, demonstrator programs, one of them for the Air Force Research Lab, and um, a derivative of that program is called the ARMED program. Both of those use kerosene fuel and are storable, and again, they really are opportunities that we see to grow this business. The RL-10 has been around for 40 years, and the idea of replacing the RL-10 is somewhat sad, but also, I think, sends a real message that Pratt & Whitney is serious about the space business. I've gotten tentative approval, and it has to go to the board, to build an engine that we call C-Cause, commercial cryogenic advanced upper stage engine. I think we have the most determined people that I have ever worked with. And, and as a result of that, they are continuously beating at my door to talk to me about new things and new ways that we can grow this business. You know, they've seen the potential. They've had the vision. And they've just been waiting for the company to catch up. Even after nearly a quarter century, the venerable F-100 was still evolving. The PW-229A adapts F-119 fan technology for a thrust increase up to 34,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds more than the original F-100 of 1974. It offers improved maintainability and is a strong contender in Pratt & Whitney's growing overseas marketing effort. And while all of this was going on, derivatives of the formidable F-119 were selected to power both contenders in the new Joint Strike Fighter competition for the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Marine Corps, and the British Royal Navy. After more than 20 years, Pratt & Whitney would be producing a new engine for the Navy. The first production F-22 was unveiled at Lockheed Martin's Marietta, Georgia plant on April 9, 1997. Today, we are pleased to officially name the F-22 after a special class of fierce and proud winged warriors. Today, we name the F-22 the Raptor. What you are building, if you build it right, if you dedicate yourself to perfection, will allow people across the planet to be free for the next half century, will allow America to lead the world for the next half century. And someday down the road, because of your dedication and your hard work, the pilot is going to return safe who might otherwise have died. What you are doing is patriotism at its most important and at its best. And on behalf of that pilot, and their spouse and their children. I want to thank each and every worker everywhere across this country who are helping America remain the leader of freedom. On September 7, 1997, 
we witnessed the flawless first flight of Raptor 01. Okay, control, I'm ready for engine start. You're clear left engine start. Here comes the throttle leg. Right. Throttle is an idle. Rotation. 10%. Flight off at 22. Okay, canopy's coming down. Dobbins ground, Raptor 22, flight of 3, F-22 from spot 53 on the south side. Raptor 06 and 19, the F-16s from the guard ramp. Taxi. Am I cleared to go? You are clear. Power's coming up. Release brakes now. Everything looks good. A little fast on the climb. Coming back. Maybe it gets right on up here. Feels real good, PA. Good ride. Yep, uh, great ride. Tower uh, Raptor 2 is rolling out at uh, 3.6 miles. Raptor 2 2, you clear to land, wind 140 at 4. And now, 1998, 40 years, four decades, a full generation and more of engineers, designers, assemblers. It was a year marked by yet another landmark event. The first two JSF-119 engines went to test in an unprecedented time, a mere 18 months after the contract award. This was also the first time in history that two different new Pratt & Whitney engines went to test at the same time. Together, the F-119, the Lockheed JSF-119, and the Boeing JSF-119 represent the evolution of a new dynasty, a new family of engines in the tradition of the WASP and the F-100. 1998, the Florida facility is now called Pratt & Whitney Large Military Engines. Division President Hansel Tukes shares his vision of the future. Being assigned to Pratt, Florida was a, uh, certainly a, a joy to me. When I came to Florida, I, I found a, a wonderful place, a place that uh, my predecessors and all the people that have worked here for many years had built a very fine business. So first of all, I, I came into a, a very nice situation. We have a wonderful market position on our military business here, uh, built on a long tradition of strong technology. I can't think of a better place to be in the aerospace industry than at Pratt & Whitney, in particular on the government side of the business. We are in the front line of uh, the fighters for the U.S. Air Force. Uh, we have a majority of, um, of, of wins around the world for application of the F-100 engine in both F-15s and F-16s. We have the 119 engine which is a foundation of, of power for the F-22 and for the Joint Strike Fighter. Our tradition here, based on gas turbine technology, is uh, just as uh, important on the space side. As you well know, our, our liquid space operations are centered here, and Angie Negron is doing a fantastic job leading that business and developing markets and technology. I think one of the most important parts of our success is the way we relate to one another. And Pratt and & Whitney here in West Palm Beach, our Florida operations are truly a family. And that's why it's easy for us to build strong development teams. Our IPD process is, is based on communicating between people. And we certainly have a spirit of core that I believe is key to our success in the past, today, and for the future. 40 years. 
I kind of divide it into four chapters, if you will, from a culture. The 60s were highly exciting, experimental work, more challenges than you could possibly imagine. Uh, technically, uh, how to get things done, you know, we were pushing the frontiers and everything. Extremely exciting. Our program, the J-58, the RL-10, uh, all the way down through the trenches, everybody was turned on. So that's the 60s. The 70s, I would put in, there two things happened. One, we won the big one. All of a sudden, man, we got, we have the F-100 program, and we're, we've got to produce because our engine is in every leading fighter in the United States. Uh, the supremacy of the skies rests on, from a propulsion standpoint, rests on these kids. Uh, we got to make it happen. So I would say the 70s was the, the make or break us as a division. We became a division in 1976. Uh, and we, we did it. Uh, not without a lot of trouble, not without a lot of setback. I always felt that that place out there performed best under pressure. Now I know all the program management theories that you shouldn't ever get into that situation. Well, that's the way the world is, you do. But I've never seen a team produce under pressure the way that bunch did. On the F-100, on the F-119 later, you could see it. We were at our best under those circumstances. So that was the 70s. The 80s, the great engine war. All of a sudden, we brought this lion into the tent, and in the eyes of our customer, our tent was too small. And so he decided, and it's his right to do so, we should have an engine competition. But the 80s was the great engine war, which consumed us too. Um, and then from now the 90s is the 119. And, and the legacy that that will give as we move into the fighters of the future. Thank God we're, we're in the, the two that are on the boards now, the F-22 and, and the JSF. So our challenge, our legacy if you will, is how to win the next engine war. Forty years. I wish I was starting all over <laughs> because it's, uh, I think it's rewarding to see uh, technology that the jet era, which is about 50 years old now, in my opinion, is only about halfway through its life. And all the things that we did and accomplished were due to one thing, our people. Sounds corny, but it's true. Without them, we'd had nothing. 42 years have been been very quick and it seemed like uh, just yesterday I started if I had to do it all over again I wouldn't change a thing. It was a very happy time. It was it was a time when people loved to come to work. They they uh, uh, were so devoted to making this equipment work that they would spend all kinds of extra hours at it. And uh, uh, it's hard to explain how people felt at all levels. Everybody was just very happy with the job. And then to win, when John Balaguer said in April of 1991, uh, April 23rd, that day will stick in infinity, that we had won. The ATF program was very exciting. Everybody was in tears, hugging each other and having a great time. And then when we saw the final airplane, which is our production model, fly just last year, out of Marietta. We were all thrilled and proud and everybody at Pratt Whitney has the right to be proud of doing a great job and making our country have air dominance for all our grandkids in the future. Though the world has changed irrevocably in these four decades, some things seem strangely familiar. Again, we held our breath as a national hero, 77-year-old John Glenn, blasted into space. This time, aboard the Pratt & Whitney-powered space shuttle. Again, our cars reflect the power and sleekness of our air and spacecraft. 
Well, most of them. Pratt & Whitney's Florida facility is perhaps a little less remote now. But the challenges are as exciting, as demanding, as they were 40 years ago. And the promises for the future are even more inspiring. Listen. Fighter pilots call it the sound of freedom. It echoes all we have been, all we are, and all we will be. It's the sound of pride, hope, and glory. For 40 years, that thunder in the sun has been our daily declaration of triumph.